Yesterday evening, we had a chance to take a look at a couple of the Psalms. And you may wonder, why the Psalms? Of course, the apostles have given us the scriptures. The prophets have. And Moses has. But the Psalms, they get to the heartbeat of who God is and who we are. There's an honesty and straightforwardness. The psalmist complained to the Lord, as in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All too often we have the answers, the theological answers, but there are times where we don't have the theological answers. So graduates, I encourage you, have more questions than answers. Christians are all too often ready to give answers, but do we have time to think and to reflect? The psalmists are doing that very thing. The occasion is the fall of Jerusalem, the cessation or suspension of the, the Davidic dynasty, and for 600 years there's no reigning Davidic monarch. How can it be? Psalm 89 has said, I will praise God because he has established David. Notice that verb, establish. God has established David. In other words, we can count on David. God affirms it again and again. David, I have chosen you. I have made a covenant with you. David, you are the one that even when your children sin, I will forgive their sins. And there's continuity. But in verse 38 of that psalm, the psalmist says, but, and then he tells you what has gone wrong. God has abandoned him. He feels as if he is like dirt being pushed to the earth. He's asking questions of God. How long is this going to last? He is likewise charging God with then an arbitrariness. The psalmist begins by saying, I'll sing of the chassadim of God, the loves of God, the great love of God. At the end, God, where are you, chassadim? And all too often, we just look at the verse and we speak about that verse, but there's a drama that is unfolding, and it is this drama that ties in so much with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when David is complaining about God's wrath, God's harshness, and it seems God's arbitrariness. He is asking questions of God, but there is no answer to these questions in Psalm 89. What do you find in Psalm 90? Just a review from last night. Psalm 90 should not be considered. It is a new book, the fourth book of Psalms, and yet, the very language of the pain of the psalmist in Psalm 89 is repeated at the very beginning of Psalm 90. God is filled with wrath. People don't have a chance to have a meaningful life. There's a futility in human existence. How can this be when God has established humanity as his agents? So there are theological questions but now this time, and it's very important to realize it, it is Moses who is speaking. He's interceding on behalf of Israel. David is no longer a party to be reckoned with. He has given his last voice in the last verse of Psalm 89. Of course, we'll read him again, but David does not have the answer. So we are looking then at someone else. Who is that someone else? An intercessor. Notice what we are beginning to see, at least I'm beginning to see it. Job is asking for an intercessor. The people are looking for an intercessor. And Moses is the best candidate. So book four talks about Moses again and again, but in book four, the last psalm speaks about the infidelity, the brazenness on the part of Moses. Moses has failed. It is as if the canon is building up. Don't look at David. Don't look at Moses. Look somewhere else. And there's the anticipation. And we find it also in the beginning of book four that God is the one who is going to provide the answer. So how does it happen? 
Moses prays, Lord, satisfy us. Give us again the joy. May we be happy. Take away the sorrows and give us then as much joy as we have experienced sorrow. What does that life look like? Look at the end of Psalm 90. Lord, be with our descendants. Let them see your glory. Let them experience your precious being with them, your love and your care. And then he uses the verb again that we have seen in Psalm 89, namely, Lord, be firm with regard to your covenant with David. Establish that covenant. Now we read, Lord, establish our children. Establish them as your servants. May they see your favor. May they enjoy your glory. That is the prayer of Moses. But then you come to the, as it were, the hallelujah chorus already in Psalm 91. In Psalm 90, we have read that God has been our dwelling place. Underlying Psalm 90 is this image of a, a dwelling place. That on the one hand, the people have been cast away from the dwelling place. And on the other hand, God is the one who can reestablish that dwelling place. So Moses is an asking for God's people to be Firmed, where they are able to find a place and they have again a place of destiny. What do we have in Psalm 91? Blessed is anyone who dwells with God. There is that sense of the dwelling with God. So, graduates, this is my challenge. We can have all kinds of activities. We can pursue faithfulness. We can pursue love. But there is a place for dwelling with God. A sense where we are best in the presence of God. A sense like Augustine spoke of, namely, that my heart is restless until it found a rest in you. And my challenge to you is, in the business of life, with all the vicissitudes of life that we experience, we have to learn to dwell in the presence of God. We have to learn to be rather than to act. In ministry, especially in these days, there are many ministers who are burned out. They give themselves to their ministry. They do a wonderful job of pastoral ministry, counseling, etc. But do we have really that quietness that we bring to the discussion, that we bring to uh, ministry, that we bring to preaching, do we have the sense of quietness? What does that look like? Read Psalm 91. Namely, it looks like finding rest in God. A God who says, sit down, do not be afraid. A God who says, I'll take care of you. Now, the marvelous thing in Psalm 91 is this, that God says, because they love me, I will take care of them. It's not Moses, it's not David, it's not the psalmist. God himself comes and says that he will take care of his people. So again, let me read these verses. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he knows my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. God is the one who can establish his people. And once established, there is a sense of a homecoming that we can experience in the very presence of God. Now I said, we need to move on to Psalm 92. But before that, let me read something from Psalm 102. We are still in book four. What do we read in Psalm 102, verse 28? The children of your servants will dwell secure. Their offspring will be established before you. Pay attention to that verb, establish. God is a God who establishes, and what he establishes is lasting. No wonder then that, that the psalmist in Psalm 89 is asking, where are you, God? Because we are expecting God to come through. 
So one of you has written a paper or a dissertation on suffering and how the church must learn to suffer. We are ready to suffer when we see the pain that takes place in terms of school shootings. When we hear about what is happening in Ukraine. And incidentally, parenthetically, uh, I've mentioned being in Ukraine. Last year at this time, I was ministering in Ukraine. And you know what has happened there. But the church is strong. I remember going to Ukraine maybe 30 years ago. And it was very weak. The church was weak. But the church had been strengthened. So please take with you, as an encouragement, what we read in the Psalms. That God wants to then enforce a presence in our lives in such a way that we are lasting. We don't give up after a year or two or ten or twenty. But rather there is a sense of that the precious kingdom of God, which is eternal, abides in you so that you are doing things for the sake of God's kingdom. Now, we need to come to Psalm 92. Would you please take a look at Psalm 92 again and again? What do we read here? There's a battle between the fools and the wise. And the psalmist then comes to the point of saying, and I'll read this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. What does this remind you of? Psalm 1, namely the tree that is planted by the streams of water. And again and again, the poets of Israel, they come back to this kind of a figure of a garden. A royal garden, a sacred garden, with trees that are planted together, that are glorious, that are beautiful, last from generation to generation. So there's a certain sense of the abiding nature in the image of the tree. So these people are like palm trees, like cedars, but they are planted in the house of the Lord. So notice again how from the very beginning of the Psalms to the very end, we are looking for home. What is our home? God's place. How do I know that I'm at God's place? Where you have the virtues of faithfulness, truthfulness, righteousness, justice. All the qualities that we read again and again. This is a kind of kingdom I want to be a part of. This is the kind of seminary I want to be a part of. This is the kind of church I want to be a part of. In other words, where is God? Where do you find the qualities of God? In people, in the community, and we have a sense of refreshing experiences. He continues, and it sounds like Psalm 1 again. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Now watch this. Proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There's no wickedness in him. Question. When the psalmist has said, why have you hidden yourself? Where are you, God? Where, are, where is your love, your deep love? Questions can be asked. But at the end of the day, we say, I have found no iniquity in God. In other words, God is good. He is good all the time. And yet we don't see it. We don't experience it. And you and I have to be strong enough to be able to answer the questions. Because people will ask us questions. And we want to respond. But what about a deliberative spirit that comes out of experience? Namely, I have been young and now I am old. But I've never seen God forsaken his people. That is a testimony that has to be borne out in church life where we have people that are just golden ages who can speak to another generation and they can say, the Lord has never truly abandoned me. I felt alone many times, but that is a part of being a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? To follow Jesus Christ who dwelt with the Father. And dwelling with the Father, he was abandoned by people. He suffered. And so we look at the Lord Jesus Christ as being more than 
one of the prophets, more than the psalmists, that Jesus Christ is the one who truly knows our spirit and that we can entrust ourselves in him. So graduates, my challenge to you is this. Don't just talk about dwelling with God. Every time you are half disappointed, dwell with God. Return home. And you will experience that he will be able to give you the comfort, the true comfort that you need. My prayers are for you and with you. The journey is great, but painful. Thank you. <laughs>